um, none better than one of the stars of, of our politics here in Britain and of Parliament, and someone I kind of hope might be the next leader of our party, Caroline Lucas. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It is so amazing to see all of you here just a few weeks before a decision that will literally define a generation. And we're here because the current debate, the daily diet of gloom and doom and xenophobia, is not speaking for us. We're here. We're here because this isn't just about a narrow transactional calculation about how much we put into the EU and how much we take out of it. This debate goes to the heart of what kind of country we want, what kind of people we are, what kind of future we want. And that's why another Europe is not only possible, but we all of us here today are committed to building it over the next few weeks, the next few months, the next few years. Because I think the truth is that those of us on the left have been for too long too quiet about our support for the EU. And I'm the first to admit that it's not perfect. It has plenty of faults. And there are the governments right now at the top table whose politics I do not share. But I cannot see how any of the major challenges we face today, from the climate crisis to the refugee crisis to the crisis of international capital, how any of those are going to be better solved by Britain trying to do it on our own rather than working with our neighbours. Now, of course, the EU needs to be reformed. The EU needs to be more democratic, more accountable, more accessible, more transparent. But do you know what? So does Westminster. And you don't see many Brexiteers saying that we should leave the UK. And when I'm on the subject of democracy, at least our MEPs are voted through a fairer voting system. To hear MPs from this government lecturing us about democracy when they're from a government elected on 24% of the eligible vote, that sticks in my throat. So we need to be in it to change it. And that's what makes today so inspiring, working together through, for example, initiatives like DM25. We can link up with progressive movements right across Europe with a vision for a more democratic, more sustainable, and more social Europe. And yes, the EU needs to change its end goals too, away from ever greater competition and privatization towards more cooperation and stronger public services. But I think we need to distinguish between the institutions of the EU and the very flawed policies that are coming out of it right now because there's a majority of right-wing governments that sit around those tables right now. TTIP is a perfect example, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership Agreement. People say, how can you support the EU when the EU is negotiating this horrible trade treaty with the US? And it is a horrible trade treaty. You know, that has that horrible investor state dispute settlement mechanism whereby private corporations will be able to sue democratically elected governments if they don't like the regulation, the health and safety, the social standards, the environmental standards that those governments are putting in place. But you know what? David Cameron and our government is one of the chief cheerleaders for TTIP. The idea that if we left the EU, we would have a lovely, cuddly trade policy in, our, in its place is a fantasy. So our best chance of fighting TTIP is working with our colleagues across Europe, three million of whom have signed a petition against TTIP, 250,000 of whom were marching in the streets of Berlin. The French government themselves are now looking as if they might block it too. That is our best way of defeating TTIP. We need to build the political momentum here for a better Europe. But that means, as I say, let's make that distinction between the institutions and the current right-wing policies of the governments that sit around it. Because you know what? If you put right-wing bigotry into the EU, surprise, surprise, you get right-wing bigotry out. And that is what we have to change. And I'm old enough to remember a time when, when it was the EU 15 and a large number of the ministers from the environment uh, ministries were actually from the Green Party. And we got some really strong environmental policy out of the EU as a result. And when I'm looking at the benefits of EU membership, then let's look at environmental policy, which, you know, by its nature, 
environmental problems are cross, cross boundary. They don't queue up politely at borders waiting for their passports to be checked. You know, the, some of the best protection that we have for our precious nature sites comes from the EU. And don't believe for a second that that would be safe if we left the EU. You know, just look at the fact that we have a prime minister who talks of getting rid of the green crack. We have a chancellor who talks about the EU nature laws being ridiculous costs. And if we, you know, if, if we don't succeed in this referendum, we then get Cameron replaced by Boris Johnson, God help us, who doesn't even believe that climate change exists. I rest my case. But, but today is also about making a very clear stand against the toxic anti-migrant rhetoric from the Brexiteers. Taking the debate out taking the debate out of the hands of the old guard, away from Tory infighting and downright xenophobia. I have to be honest in saying that part of what motivates me to be so active on this issue is fear of what could happen to this country if we leave. Because take a look at the campaign that is being run by the Brexiteers. This toxic mixture of harking back to an imaginary golden age and scaremongering about migration. And think about what Britain would look like if they got their way. What kind of country that they would like to try and build. Because at the heart of the Vote Leave vision is a vision of a small-minded Britain, with our borders closed and our horizons narrowed. And that is what we're fighting against today. <laughs> but I want to say a few words specifically about free movement. What an amazing gift it is that we are able to live and love and work and study and move around 28 member states. We should not be apologizing for free movement, we should be celebrating free movement. <laughs> but we need to make free movement work for everyone. And it's perhaps easy for politicians to forget that rapid changes in population can cause localized pressures on services, and that employers can drive down wages when the workforce expands rapidly. But you know what, that's true whether people are moving from Leicester to London just as much as from Krakow to Coventry. And let's not think for a moment that those new arrivals should be blamed for those challenges, or that the government cannot solve them if they choose to do so. By reinvesting that economic dividend that, brings, that is brought into those areas precisely by people moving into them, and by enforcing a minimum wage and raising that minimum wage. But let's also ban for the whole of today and beyond the term EU migrant. It is a horrible, dehumanizing term. We are talking about our doctors, our nurses, our shopkeepers, our friends, our neighbors, our partners, and our loved ones. And any debate about the future of the EU should be about appreciating the difference that they make to our lives. And in conclusion, let me just say one last thing, that I think that the European story itself should be celebrated to some extent as well. You know, I think it is quite remarkable that a continent that has been riven by conflict for so long has now decided to come together to try to solve its problems through debate and discussion rather than bullets and bombs. And it's not that long ago since this continent was riven with that conflict. And so the EU was not born of some kind of abstract philosophizing in Brussels think tanks. It was born on the bodies and the bones of the people who died in two savage world wars. And I think we do forget that at our peril. I don't pretend that the EU has been the only force for peace, but I do think that peace is impossible without the EU. So yes to staying inside the EU, yes to reforming the EU, and let's accept the fact that another Europe, as they say, is not only possible but it is on her way, and in the lovely words of Arundhati Roy, on a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you.